Marnina, you want to say hi? She can't. I don't think. No, she can't. Okay. And Sean. Uh, Marnina says hi. <laughs> hi, Sean Sarr, it's Arts Director for the City. Um, we also have uh, Helen might join us, who's our, our other SPIA Service Corps uh, fellow. Um, so I'll keep you all posted if she jumps on. Um, I'm just watching who's in the waiting room and all that kind of stuff. So we can get started. All right. Well, the first thing we need to look at is the minutes. I don't believe they were uploaded. No, the, they were. Yeah, we'll have them at the next meeting. So sorry about that. No worries. So we can skip that since nobody has had a chance to review that. And Sean, if you can speak to the financials. Yeah, no, no change. We're still at uh, 61, uh, 635 and then uh, 3,961 in the old postcard um, funds. So no, no change here month over to month. So. All right, well, with no changes on the financials and before we get into the nitty gritty of our own projects and everything that we have going on, it's one of those days where we start with a bit of a presentation. So go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're gonna kind of uh, take turns speaking here on the presentation. Um, thank you again for having us today. Um, we're representing the rest of our um, MFA photography cohorts at IU Bloomington who were not able to be here today, but um, we're here to share our community outreach art project with you, the Bloomington Projection Project. So the Bloomington Projection Project's mission is to bring the community together through art by projecting a collection of poems, short stories, and artwork onto a building within the area. We aim to build a space for the community to connect and engage in discussion. By projecting the citizens' poems and short stories alongside artwork referencing the written pieces in a public space, our goal is to make art more accessible and to foster a sense of empathy within the community. The Bloomington Projection Project strives to take the exclusivity of having art in a gallery or museum out of the equation. Having the community represent themselves with written word and having artists produce work in reflection of that writing provides an opportunity to harness the power of the relationship between art, artist, and community, as well as working to bridge the gap between the broader town and Indiana University. A, a quick overview of our project before we get into the details is that we're trying to partner with community organizations to collect poems and short creative writing pieces from members of the community. And we'll be making photography-based artwork in response to and in reflection of the submitted writings. During our community event, the artwork that's created and the writing as well will be shared with the outdoor projection. Um, writers will also be invited to read their work aloud. And an online publication will be launched at that time to include the writings and will be made available to everyone in the community. The theme for our project is what makes a community, specifically in reference to Bloomington. The uh, Bloomington Projection Project uh, strives for a wide, rich selection of voices from people of all walks of life. We have reached out to the Boys and Girls Club, um, Bloomington Pride, and Bell Trace to promote the project and involve their members. So the projection and reading will be a public event meant to activate the voices of the writers and bring art into a space for everyone. It removes art from the gallery to make it more accessible. And the online publication provides everyone who contributed a place of publication and a place where other members of the community can read the poems and stories. It creates a platform for the community to better understand and engage in current issues and solutions through the hearing of stories, hearing stories of others. The uh, final collaborative art piece will be projected outdoors um, for accessibility, but also to ensure safety at this time. Um, throughout the presentation, community members can share their writing, poetry, stories, anecdotes um, by reading them out loud. All of the submitted writing will be published online with the author's permission and will be included in that uh, final magazine. So our timeline of events at this time is on Friday, September 11th, the call for submissions will go out and those submissions will be due on October 4th so that we have time to create the work in response. 
The projection will take place November 20th, which is on a Friday right before Thanksgiving and will take place between 6 and 8 p.m. So each of our seven cohort members will be creating about six to eight photographs each uh, to be projected in conjunction with the text submitted by community members. This will result in over 40 photographic works developed into a single presentation and projected on a loop throughout the event. The artwork will be created in direct response to the community's writings that were previously collected and the projection in addition to the artwork will also include excerpts from the community's writings. Some locations we are excited about include local parks and public buildings in the downtown area, but we are struggling to identify the best location at this time. In reaching out to the Bloomington Arts Commission, we are open to any suggestions you have that will help make the project both successful and celebratory for the community. These are the names of the graduate students involved in this project. Many of the graduate students at IU are transplants from all over the country. And this project not only allows us to explore the community of Bloomington through its citizens in their own words, but also offers the opportunity to show our appreciation for our new home. We would like to thank the Bloomington Arts Commission once again for agreeing to hear our proposal. We would now like to open the presentation up for any questions, concerns, or suggestions you may have. Thank you. That was a lot of information, um, a lot more detailed than we at last time, so I really appreciate that. Questions, comments from our commissioners? Uh, hey there, Elliot here. Um, as someone who spends a lot of time thinking about like community engaged art and also like social practice, uh, and again, I am also fairly new transplant to Bloomington. I came here about a year and a half ago. So I don't know that I have great suggestions for which buildings to project on. I know the Eskenazi Museum is a great facade, but that's not really downtown and maybe not as public. But um, how are you identifying collaborators uh, with this project, community collaborators? Can you tell us more about that process? Laura, do you want to go? It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, we started by just looking at all the different um, community organizations that are here in Bloomington. I've been here about a month. This is my first year, so I'm not familiar with um, the organizations that are here. Um, and we just um, selected a few to work with that may kind of give us a broad range of the different people in Bloomington. We are not um, trying to limit it to any group or another. We're definitely open to working with anybody. Um, so if you do have any suggestions on any organization or group that you feel like would be really great to be represented here or to work with, we would definitely be open to hearing that. Uh, Babette here, are you only looking to do this in one location or have you considered maybe considering uh, COVID and everything else, who knows what will happen by November, uh, maybe a couple of locations? That's not something we had considered doing a couple locations, but it's definitely something for us to consider moving forward. Thank you. And I also wanted to say that I commend you on the spread of groups from um, uh, the Boys and Girls Club to Bell Trace. I think that's very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, hey, this is Nick. Um, I'm I'm curious. So, as far as trying to find a location or or maybe locations, um, what's sort of your physical criteria? I mean, obviously things like accessibility, but are you looking for like the biggest blank white wall you can find, or do you want a surface with you know with features um, and that, that that will give things texture? Like, what what's what's your ideal? I think the ideal is that we have something that is less textured and large enough for a projection to be viewed safely by everyone who can come to the event. So if it's too small, then people standing six feet apart might struggle to see it from a distance. Um, so we're looking for something relatively large, but also less textured. A little bit of texture is fine. And I understand like concrete walls and such will always have a little bit of a texture. 
um, but we're trying to avoid places with very chunky textures and big windows and such. Um, so Babette kind of asked this, but um, it's, it's like one event, one evening event. It's not like these artworks will be up at different locations for a, a, a period of time. It's just one night. That's correct. We have it currently planned to be a one night event where the artwork will be um, displayed over the course of a couple hours so people can kind of come and go. They don't have to stay there for the full two hours sort of thing. And so your um, location also kind of needs a some sort of place for the audience to hang out, like a field or whatever. Yes, yeah, some place where people can socially distance and still enjoy the artwork. Any suggestions of places? Can anybody think of? Well, I was I was thinking of the the Duke Energy thing up by on Eleventh Street because that's just a blank wall hanging out. Um, and you, there's a giant field kitty corner to it, but I don't know if you could get the projection big enough. But that. That came to my mind. Thanks. Definitely something we can look into. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? I'm not particularly, but I will look into it. Um, I don't know so what it is. It's on 11th Street in Rogers, and it is a Duke Energy big wall to like cover up their stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, right on 11th and Rogers. Oh, they're ugly. Yeah, it's it's near Upland. Okay. Thank uh, you. Ugly stuff, also known as substation. Yeah, ugly stuff. And the projection technology, uh, what are you working with or what are you hoping to work with? Sorry, I just finished a huge projection project, so I'm thinking all about lumens and row and everything right now. We have several projectors at our disposal right now um, through the department. Um, I'm glad that you brought that up because I had not thought to check on that. So I think it's very important that we make sure that we're uh, using something bright enough. Um, so I will definitely make a note and check on that and I can get back with you. Sometimes Great. you can just um, coordinate two projectors at the same time and overlap them and that will basically duplicate your lumens. Okay. Thank you. There might be a possibility, I mean, it's private property, um, but uh, there is a lot that is on Kirkwood across from the Buzzkirk Chumley. Uh, that's the CVS parking lot. That's a possibility. There's a build, it's the old CVS building. Might, might, might work there. You could project onto the building and then have people like in that parking lot. The backside of the Buzzkirk Chumley would be a possibility too, because uh, there's a parking lot there. Um, that's on 4th and Washington, uh, which is actually not far from another IU project site. Um, but you, we could reserve the parking spots in that parking lot or some parking spots potentially through the city to do that. But there's a pretty clean slate on the backside of the Buzzkirk Chumley um, that could be of use. Um, I'm trying to think of what else in the downtown area that would be. I mean, Switchyard Park has some potential. Um, the pavilion area at Switchyard Park, um, which could be easily physically distanced and that kind of stuff. So there, there might be an opportunity there. There's power outlets and stuff like that. Um, so you don't have to rent a generator. That's another thing to consider is the location and whether you have power access or not. Um, some of our light poles have access to power. Some don't. So it just kind of depends on uh, the final location. So as you guys develop potential locations just keep me in the loop and I can try to figure out where we have access to power so it, there's you some, to yeah. Yeah. There, there's something to be said for having it more on a building than in the park you know more of the urban stories the or urban people sharing this versus the park that feels a little bit more like two hours of entertainment I'm in agreement with that yeah the chance encounter would be really interesting to, to me and I feel like potentially audience building, but you know, it depends on the nature of and the spirit of the project. If, uh, if we came up with uh, more ideas after this meeting, what is the best way for us to get those to you? Um, I am actually in contact with Sean right now, but I can give you my email address now if you would like that. Yeah, you can just add it into the chat if you want, and that way we can all just copy and paste. Great. Oh. 
All right. Anybody have anything else to add? I was just, if, if you want to do it inside, the History Center has two big locations, and usually in the downstairs one, they don't have anything going on particularly. So that might be available. Okay, thank a, you. A good bad weather backup too. Yeah. It's a capacity issue for you all too, but uh, I would also suggest the Banneker Community Center as a potential partner for youth and, and teens. They're usually not the same users of the Boys and Girls Clubs. Uh, Girls Inc. is another one that I would throw out there as well as um, Shalom Center. What was the last one? I'm sorry. Shalom Center. Okay, thank you. I just, I just think you have to just keep remembering what's going to be going on you know when you make your plans in November that it could be a real mess <laughs> <laughs> yes so covering contingencies where people can assume people have to safely distance and want to go wherever they could ostensibly yeah, yeah. safe like even if if they had to drive by you know that's kind of like what I consider the worst case scenario where yeah, that's why I like the outdoor. Person. I thought it was really could be good. How about I wonder what's happening at the drive-in in November? All right. Well, it seems like we're ready to move on to the next thing, unless anybody stops me right now. All right. Then let's hand it over to Sean and Nick with a big thank you to Laura and Andy for their project and keep us posted, keep us updated and we'll email you if we have any ideas. So Nick and Sean, take it away with public art projects and all of the updates that you have. Yeah, so um, first thing, I guess the uh, trades garage, um, we have submissions from our three finalists that Sean is showing here now. Um, as of today, we're scheduling interviews uh, with the three finalists. Um, it'll be 30 minute interviews, common set of questions. Um, and those will be happening um, here in the next week and a half. And then we'll be meeting uh, next Friday, I believe the 18th, um, if I have that date right. And we will uh, talk through it and hopefully hash it out. Um, so all these materials are uh, available if you want to take a deeper dive, um, but they feel like largely good, good natural extensions, developments of what, what we saw in initial proposals. Um, any yeah. questions about the trades garage? I would just add that all three are fairly distinct from each other and will deliver a completely different story. Um, so as you review them on the documents, you know, keep in mind that what is it that we should be saying to the public through the through the trades garage? Yeah. Um, anyone else who's been part of that review process? Anything to add at this point? I just have one question. Mm -hmm. um, the when I was looking at all three of this, what I was thinking about was what they were going to look like daytime versus nighttime, but also the the only way, to, I assume there's an elevator in the trades garage, but the stairs are going to be in use. So there's a safety factor in being, you know, in work going up and down the stairs with these. And do we need to have somebody look at that or just keep that in mind or what? Yeah, I mean, we have to keep that in mind uh, as always, but that's that's my kind of role in terms of staff, clearing it with the architects, you know, what the clearance is. Obviously the building is designed, was designed with the builder of artwork happening there. So the architects are aware of it, all that kind of stuff. It just, we'd have to be careful about um, what we do choose though. I mean, that's a consideration. Well, I, I guess I was thinking about walking up and down the steps and you know at nighttime in the dark or not or with the lighting and the rest of it if there's if there's something uh that would make it less safe and therefore the city would say you know in terms of people breaking their necks and insurance and liability 
Well, there's gonna the the artists are gonna have to design around the the parameters of having light in that space. So we'll be able to kind of control some of it, but there's safety protocols that we have to abide by. It's not gonna these renderings are not the actual what it's gonna look like, right? Like there's never like this the artist renderings are to try to highlight and make the artwork look as best as possible, which of course they would want to control the light, but there's safety factors that we have to take into consideration about how many, you know, what's the standard protocol of lighting in a hallway, you know, visibility. I mean, part of the reason why that is a glass encased um, staircase is a safety factor in general, right? Like, so we're, we've, we've taken into a lot of the consideration, uh, from that, from the get-go, from the design of the building as, as a whole. So uh, the artworks will have to respond to the standard public safety requirements of a fire department, of all of those kinds of things. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't get too hung up on that at, at, in this phase yet. Yeah, we don't necessarily have to pre-vet all those details, but, but I think, like you said earlier, Sean, we should consider um, how challenging the concepts might be to conform to the physical space. Yeah. Um, and look out for things that, you know, like if it feels like a concept only works if it's if the lighting elements are surrounded by darkness, right? Like that's not that's not practically how this space is going to be used. So, um, yeah, that's that's a that's a really good question, Babette. Yeah, that was my next question. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts or questions on the trades garage? Okay, um, then we can move on to the Switchyard Park uh, final design that we have. So, um, right. Am I still scared? Me? Sorry, I'm getting. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, we can see it. Um, so this is the uh, the rail themed design. Um, that, that was the original concept. And then the other image um, is the Big Dipper, North Star, um, Underground Railroad homage. Um, and so I think with, with this, what we're going to want to try to do today is um, after, after whatever questions or discussion, um, I'm going to want to move to approve the final design. I think the one caveat I'll throw in Sean, if you want to move back to the other slide real quick, um, is I think we are still having a, co a conversation about colors on this. Um, uh, Karen did a call um, with the uh, History Center. Um, you know, we're sort of inquiring about the the history of um, actual uh, rail lines and rail cars um, that uh, were used on this line that passed through the park or the space that, that is now the park. Um, and so I think the, the color elements could change. We could still advise on those. Um, but I think the, the core design here so that we can, you know, potentially move forward with, um, uh, they can start working on fabrication and things like that. Um, that's what we're hoping to come out of today. Um, so uh, what thoughts or questions do folks have? Um, this is the original um, proposal uh, that we looked at when we, selected them. I think the shape is a great improvement. It is a lot more streamlined and it no longer looks like sailboat. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, Karen, was there anything that, that you wanted to share from your call or any other thoughts from folks who've been part of this? Um. Well, uh, actually, with our call, I don't think we got direct information about colors on rail cars, but I think that they agreed that uh, they'd see what they had. Um, I had done some, um, some web research, and we came up with the colors might actually be primary colors. Um, at first, I thought that maybe wasn't very interesting, but now that I'm looking at this, I think that could be a possibility, actually. And, and I mean, Sam may want to weigh in in, in terms of uh, how children may view it because this is supposed to be interactive and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, and to, and to remind everyone where this building is located, um, 
this is by the uh, the splash pad, um, you know, which is sort of adjacent to the main plaza, but also uh, not too far off from the playground. Um, so yeah, the expectation is that uh, this will be hopefully uh, highly interactive with children. Well, and this facade faces the B line, right? So think about it that way too, right? So there's going to be some pretty heavy users on this. Um, and then this is the, uh, would that be West facade, which faces the amphitheater. So, and um, just for everybody's understanding too, um, the lights are gonna, in the daytime, look like this, right? So these kind of copper, it's kind of a nice little thing, but as the night, goes on, they'll slowly illuminate and there'll be this kind of um, star-like quality to it. So there's a pulse to these LEDs that's really, really um, pretty unique and pretty special. So it's going to it's gonna be, a, I think, a really nice nighttime installation, but also there in the daytime, very present, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, Karen and Babette were both on the call as well as Tyler with the History Center. Um, there's some good timings of other things happening around the history of the Underground Railroad and celebrating that in Bloomington. Covenant or Cemetery is getting a, a marker. And so the History Center is happy to connect us to any kind of archival stuff, which there isn't much, but we know some truths and some, you know, myths around it in Indiana. Uh, and then they also have a ton. I went to the History Center yesterday. They have a, by the way, they have a really great TC Steel exhibition you all should see. It's pretty fantastic um, that they did with IU Bicentennial. Um, but they have a ton of stuff on the Monon, the CSX, all that stuff. And so uh, Rachel and Tom will have plenty of access um, for, for other kind of avenues. If we wanted to do a Monon line into the, the design or if we wanted to do a CSX line and a color card to correspond directly with those companies, we could do that, frankly. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm no uh, child psychology expert or anything, but I, I think I think bright colors would be good. Overall, um, the train the needs to have bright colors. Yeah, so I think we're fine there. Um, I did just notice with the with the Big Dipper, we got to make sure we have the orientation right. And in one of the things, it's it's facing one way, and the other, it's kind of facing the other in the, between the two different diagrams. Yeah, that's a good point. So just just. That's one little detail that somebody yeah. might. Yeah, do. that's one not to goof up. Yeah. yeah. And just a reminder is that how close are we to those lime green um, seats? We're close. I mean, they are all around the splash pad, but the picnic tables that are going to be right next to it are not the lime green, I believe. Okay, so maybe, you know, thinking about bright colors like that go with the line or not if, and look good on brown. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it, it will be good to see what they research, yeah. um, what they come back with and then take it from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that turquoise is horrible. <laughs> But aside from the colors, um, does anybody have anything else to object to that would keep us from pushing the, this project forward? Cool. So, so I Penny... did have a thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Um, I was wondering about the material. Uh, I assume it's some sort of metal that that it's made from the the train one. Is there any uh, intention for there to be like a double tubing? Uh, I'm not sure. I can find out. Um, as as far as I remember, it's powder coated steel, which uh, um, is yeah. It's, as far as I know, it's powder coated steel. I don't think it's tubing at all. Oh, okay. Yeah, I believe so. And then the cars, um, you know, which are basically just going to be like rectangular you know, metal pieces also, I believe, powder coated. Um, uh, I believe the the pieces that those, those will actually, the cars can move, or at least some of them can. Um, and they'll have basically like a rail system 
uh, sort of behind or on top of um, the powder coated steel so the cars can actually slide back and forth. And it's, it's, it's child proof too. So like, it's not like a kid can get its finger caught and, and ran over or anything like that. It's, they've been engineering it so that it can, it's offset of, off the limestone. So it's kind of like a locked in kind of, so think about like, um, like the old children's toys with the wood that you would like push through at like every doctor's office has. It's kind of like that, but powder coated steel essentially. Um, or that's how they explained it to us from what I remember. But I, I also have a call with them on Friday. So if we approve this final design, I can kind of ask some of those questions to get some more clarity on timeline. But the the way this timing works, um, they final approval, it, based off the contract, basically you all have to approve the design so that I can, uh, they can start to invoice and start to fabricate. They, it's just written out in the contract that way. So it's just one of the you know safety precautions that we have as the art commission to oversee that the commission is what we wanted and what was intended and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I guess with the caveats um, that colors are still being discussed um, for the rail feature and that Sean will verify the orientation of the Big Dipper feature, um, can I move to approve uh, these designs? Second. All in favor? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Did you, I seconded or I, I approved. All right. Do we need to do roll call, Sean? No, yeah, we can do uh, like everybody just say, like all opposed, all in favor, yay. Uh, and then follow up with, uh, you know, the okay, everybody, everybody unmute one, two, three, <laughs> whoever says yay, raise your hand and say yay. 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 Anybody opposing? All right. Great. It moves. Um, thank you, everybody. And then uh, other updates. I mean, uh, Sean, you can jump in if you want to add anything to this, but um, 4th Street Garage. Uh, contracts are signed. Mm -hmm. uh, Projects payment, underway. Payments rolling. Yeah, let me, uh, let me get back into here. Um, so just for the sake of Helen and Elizabeth and yeah, Laura. Let's see. And, uh, let's see where am I? So yeah, so we're under contract. Um, this is underway. Pretty exciting. So. Um, I'll be in touch with them about what the updated timeline is. Obviously, 4th Street is underway. Uh, it's looking pretty good. I'm um, excited to see how this shakes out. Um, trades, District Plaza. Uh, we're, doing, we're going through a redesign here. It's a little bit smaller. We're still waiting back on numbers for powder coating and uh, the kind of resize. Uh, we're, we're still over budget a little bit, um, but we're getting there slowly. Um, People's Park is currently on hold. Um, Ann Holohan and, and Bob um, were concerned about the rush of painting over the Black Lives Matter. So we're kind of in uh, negotiation of a new timeline, which I think is an appropriate kind of moment for us to consider and maybe engage in a, a couple different processes. We also have um, the partnership, well, not really the partnership, the Banneker Community Centers, uh, Black Lives Matter, Street Mural is moving forward. Um, I just got word that we'll be taking a resolution to the city council on September 23rd. Um, if any of you all are interested, um, you're more than welcome to attend that meeting. You don't have to. Uh, it's really, you know, the Banneker Advisory Committee uh, really uh, leading that project, but we're going to be assisting with that. Um, they've gotten a few more submissions, so I think they're going to be selecting the artist here soon. Um, so it's actually, it's actually good with the People's Park thing because some of those artists might lead to the People's Park conversation and just making sure that there is this kind of visual continuity with all of those various projects happening. Um, and I think that's it on the public art is, side. Is there anything specific that you'd need from us in regards to the banner? Not at the moment. Okay. But we're really, uh, I'm really, This that's a really community led project. We're trying to make sure it stays that way. Um, the resolution will be uh, just the resolution on behalf of the city, which I think is really important. Uh, you know, uh, some 
folks are thinking that we're a little bit behind the times on this, but I, I, at the same time, Kansas City just did six. You know, we're still in the process of looking at the downtown location. And then, the, you know, there's conversations on campus about the renaming of Jordan Avenue, Jordan Hall, and the potential for, you know, a student group to organize and do a Black Lives Matter mural on Jordan Avenue, which would be pretty interesting and a pretty interesting conversation for us to consider as a whole. Um, Indy, uh, Indianapolis just opened their Indiana Avenue back open to traffic for the first time since they painted the Black Lives Matter mural. So it's been kind of interesting to see how other cities are doing it. So for us to kind of go through this process, it's been really helpful um, and try to get the right kind of artists lined up in, in that process, so. Perfect, any questions from anybody? Has anything happened with the 10th Street mural on the bike shop? Uh, still working on negotiations with the property owner. On okay. All right. Well, if nobody has anything else for public art, shall we move on to grants? Yeah, real quick. I just want to, um, Liz, Elizabeth just jumped on, Liz Clayfee did, and Laura, you all don't have to hang out for the whole meeting. I mean, if you're taking notes and want to see what's going on, Liz, your students did great. We're so excited about the project, you know. Um. I'm over here creeping in the corner. <laughs> I, thank you so much, Sean, and thank you guys all. I mean, I see my students beaming. I'm so excited to watch the, the recap, and yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Thanks, y'all. And Rachel. Go. Yeah, um, there aren't really, I mean, there's updates, but there's not a ton. Uh, September meeting is canceled, which was going to be on September 18th. But because of um, all the public art meetings that are going to be happening on that day, we have canceled um, that one, which is kind of okay, because there's not a ton of actionable stuff now. As Sean's pulled up, this is the Recover For Forward program grant that we're, um, the BUEA is leading, CAC is supporting, um, and we're in the middle of the application period closes October 2nd. So there's not a ton for us to do as a grant committee right now. We will need to have, I would like two, but at least one person representing the BAC to um, sit in on the review panel for the BUA. Uh, we can figure that out via email who's available and interested in, in doing so. But um, Sean, when do you need to know by? Uh, I mean, the sooner the better, obviously. So we can start to kind of parcel this out but I mean obviously we won't have anything until October 2nd so we have a little bit of time but uh, if people want to be able to help it's going to be a two-week turnaround so the first two weeks of October whoever's the most available it'd be great to have uh, two members of the BAC involved it's a fairly simple process um, in terms of reviewing we can walk you through all that um, but it, I will say it will be a very tight two-week turnaround though um, and it, I, I don't suspect more than 40 applications but we'll divvy it up so that you probably won't read more than 10 or 12. Um, but that's usually the framework of the grants. Essence, I saw you raise your hand. Do you want to do it? All right, you've got one. Yay. Anybody else? I'll go in. I, I actually enjoy reading grants. Yay. OK, Ellie and Essence, you guys are great. Um, Don't ask me why. I'll do it, though. It, I will <laughs> say these grant applications, if you do have a chance, um, to go onto the website and look through the application questions and stuff. It's not super long, like compared to other grants. It's really, it's really not as, um, oh, there you go, it's two pages. And there, it seems like there's a lot of questions, but it's, it's pretty standard and um, the applications through Google Forms. So um, it should be pretty well organized uh, for you to, to look at. But, yeah, so just, just so everybody knows, uh, I worked with Jane and really trim down. This is basically the same grant that we had in April, but updated in terms of the timeline. Uh, did you use what I sent you or did you not use that? Uh, we used some of the questions, yeah. So um, this is this is basically just an updated version. Uh, you know, um, the, the city and the BUEA is very, you know, uh, concerned about equity issues. So we have a big equity commitment question uh, and then we kind of updated the kind of COVID-19 um, kind of 
concerns, questions, because the, there's also a portion of this grant funding that is allotted for venues specifically. Um, they have been uh, kind of handcuffed uh, to certain uh, state and federal and local restrictions, and they've been doing everything they can to ensure safety, but they've been left out of some of these frameworks in terms of CARES Act. So the BUAA found that it was really important to make sure that our venues in the downtown and, and especially in the urban enterprise zone were uh, thought of. So I've, I've reached out to almost all the venues just to make sure that they're aware of the grant and to apply, even though some of the questions might be a different kind of framework for them. So they're working on that. Um, and, you know, this is for project and programming, though we will need to be considerate as we read through this that if two weeks there's a spike and we go into shelter and home, just considering those kind of frameworks for grantees and grant applications. Um, so um, that's, yeah, read through. We try to trim it down. If the original grant um, that we did in April had like 35 questions and we got this really down to uh, less than 20 because it includes like applicant name. That's not really a question, right? <laughs> so- Link uh, down stuff. Yeah, it's pared down, so. Uh, it shouldn't be too complicated, but please encourage people to apply. Uh, they have to tie it into the BUEA. Uh, they, you know, have to, have to be kind of arts and culture focused. Uh, but the more uh, we have money to give out, and we want to give it out. So, um, yeah. Yep, that's it. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Essence and Elliot, for stepping up. Um, I'm sure you'll enjoy the process. You, you get to learn a lot about our community that way. Um, anything else on grants? Double checking. All right, let's move on to kind of the bits and pieces. The Waldron letter, I've been wanting to send that out, but I don't have all signatures. And before I either add everybody's names or send it incomplete, I want to double check that it is approved and everybody wants to sign it. I have no problem adding your names but I do have a problem sending kind of like what looks like a divided BAC right now because not everybody's represented. Um, so I wanna hear back from you in terms of the signatures. Um, some of you have signed, some of you haven't. If you haven't, you know, what's stopping you before we sent out that letter? Uh, who hasn't? I, I can't remember if I did. <laughs> you did. Oh, I did, okay, great, thanks. <laughs> Do you want to just say who has? Um, Maybe we don't know. We didn't. <laughs> sure. Let's see. I do have it open here. Uh, 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 Sorry. Sure. That's okay. It's just, you know, it's one of those things where I don't want to assume anything. Rachel, Babette, Essence, Quentin, Elizabeth, Karen, and Sam. Yeah, I will obviously sign on uh, i did review it it just august was my install month i was putting together a couple of shows at the museum so no worries as i said i just i just want to dot my i's and cross my t's and not add anybody's name that doesn't want to be added no and i appreciate that yeah and and yeah i've just there are a few things that have kind of flown by me this month just because i've been in the galleries no worries for something so yeah but um yeah thank you Okay. Um, let me go back to the agenda here. Switched. After that, we have, okay, the Community Arts Awards, <laughs> the Ivy Tech Community Awards. This is something that we need to start thinking about. Um, it usually happened, I believe, in December with submissions and uh, the whole process basically during the fall. Now that the wall drone is no longer as it was, we no longer have those awards and that kind of citizenship recognition. And it is up to the BAC to decide if we want to step up and take up on that role or let it all dwindle and die. <laughs> Any uh, thoughts? Yes. With all of the insanity that is 2020, I say we let it die and we can revive it later, but there's just like so much, so much going on right now. If we could plan a virtual <laughs> awards event, but that just seems like a, a lot of work for a little return. 
Yeah, for me, it's not so much about the event itself. It's more about having people be seen and noted versus... Yeah, I mean, we could do nominations and just do like a, a thank you to these people or this is who's... But I don't know if that's even worth our time, though. I don't know like how far that would spread in terms of recognition. I don't, I don't know. I would you put something in the paper just so do that you know because i agree with rachel completely i mean just but if you feel people if people will miss being acknowledged then we could do it and just put a little note in the paper the paper <laughs> can i ask a question why um why why is this our responsibility why do and i'm just i'm gonna be really blunt why, why do we care yeah. i feel like i feel like um most awards are inherently self-congratulatory for a small group of people um and it takes a lot of work to make them more than that and i think based on the history of the last couple of years of these awards that have happened in person they have uh failed to reach far beyond that and so i feel like we should only do it if we have the energy and passion to make it more and make it something that the wider community cares about. So um, I guess, are we a pre prepared to bite that off? Because if it's like gonna be even a slighter version of what happened last year, um, I'm not sure how much value that has outside of like 50 people in town. <laughs> Hot take. Yeah. I, no, no, that's totally fine. At some this point, <laughs> based on the interviews and the feedback that we were receiving, there was conversation not so much as an award, as a recognition, more from the city standpoint versus like, yeah, you're the best artist in town kind of thing, more of a community engagement, um, things like that. I, I have, I'm 50-50 on this. I have no qualms dropping it or taking it on personally. Um, I just want to make sure that we're aware of this either disappearing or us wanting to take on that from the from the city perspective. So, I mean, so no. oh, sorry. Um, so, Brandy, you're saying like people want to be recognized by the city or organizations yeah. want to be recognized by the city. I'm struggling to. I, I don't know. I uh, I mean, I agree with Nick. I don't think the awards are the way to do that. And if there's another way to do that, then like, to me, it would be having some sort of like end of year holiday thing. But because we're in a pandemic, it's kind of like, why would we do that? And also we have so many meetings that they could come to so we could shout them out and like, sorry, my thing keeps going, um, shout them out and acknowledge them and give them the recognition, but no one's here. And like, I don't know if setting up another event to try to bring people to us, or I know, like, can we go to them? But it's, I don't know where that balance is. Yep. To be honest. It's very valid. I think it's good to just maybe for the new commissioners and just in general for this conversation to talk about the history of it and why the way it is, right? So the Community Arts Awards was started by the Art Council of Bloomington or the Bloomington Area Arts Council, now defunct. It was their annual luncheon. This was part of their annual advocacy platform every year. It was so popular that it was like the BDC or the city of Bloomington or any kind of annual luncheon that filled the convention center. It was a big advocacy day for them. When the area council, art area or area arts council folded, Ivy Tech kind of inherited the mantle with also the Waldron. So it was a way to pay tribute to the Area Arts Council, it was supposed and intended to create advocacy for the arts, not necessarily be celebratory for individual artists and arts organizations. Ivy Tech's version had to be obviously tied to Ivy Tech's interest, which I think led to its inability to um, cast a wider net, so to speak. What I would propose to the BAC to consider, which is what we intended to do this June was to have a broader advocacy night in general tied into the grants that we normally do. So maybe think about how we incorporate those opportunities into the efforts we do. 
not necessarily awards. Um, the city actually doesn't give out awards. We really don't. There's commissions and, and boards and those things that do that. We could do that. It's another thing we would have to do as an art commission that you all would have to do, not me, but you all. Um, so that's just something to consider uh, in terms of um, that. But I, th I do think there is an interesting moment for us to consider moments of celebration in the arts, creating broader awareness around that. How can we get more people from the public involved in the grant ceremony and our annual report to the city council? Those kinds of things. So I think it would just be important to have that framework. Yeah, and I have and I have no problem, you know, calling Rachel at um, Arts Alliance and saying, "Hey, this is this is falling apart. Do you want to take it on um, as the Arts Alliance of Greater Bloomington?" That could totally work as well, and just kind of coach them through. Essence, Essence, you raise your hand. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Um... How, what is the, the nomination process like? Would that be amongst us? Or would um, citizens nominate? How does it work? I believe that's how it worked last time. So the, okay. there was a, a, an advisory board that was part Ivy Tech, part City uh, Arts Commission, and members of the public. And then there was like five categories that you could nominate people. Uh, or organizations, and then th they were selected from there. So it was like, it's similar. Um, other commissions do that here at the city too, like um, the Swagger Awards and all that kind of stuff. It's it's a public process. So you would open it up to the public and then you would have some kind of review panel. Um, and the Ivy Tech would give out this like kind of cool designed award. Um, there also could be a broader interest, but once again, it's would be tied to their members you could partner with the chamber, you know, like there's, there's a variety of different ways we can approach this. Um, you know, Bryony can broker a deal with Art Alliance Greater Bloomington. I think that's an interesting model to look at. Um, that should be in their wheelhouse uh, in terms of uh, being a kind of a, a guild society. So, um, you know, it's up to the commission to think about. Nick? It was it given to individuals and they picked like five or organizations or both. What? Both, yeah. I didn't realize it was like it. lifestyle lifetime Life achievement, um education, education. Yeah. um small business in support of the arts. And one or two others. Yeah. And like advocate, community advocate or something, right? Was another one. Nick, you want to say something? Yeah, no, I, I was going to say, I, I think I've done well, and I think I've tied in with um, other initiatives, like like a couple of folks have talked about here. I think there can be value to it. I, I think my, my point is just, it has to be um, a better version of what it's been the last few years. Um, and so we'd have to set a higher bar. I do wonder, I know we've had a few conversations, and this sort of ties into, you know, strategic plan and some other things that we've talked about in meetings, you know, about um you know uh, di different other concerns that the BAC has whether it's education or advocacy or community engagement um you know diversity and inclusion access um things like that i wonder if um this is maybe something that we should set on pause and figure out what is the BAC's mechanism you know whether it's a committee or someone tapped as like um you know, a standalone, you know, chair, you know, who's concerned with community engagement or concerned with advocacy, and then put the question to that. I you cut out. Yeah, we can't hear you, Nick. <laughs> I feel like this happens almost every Zoom meeting with Nick. <laughs> Give it a minute. Oh, did I drop out? Yeah, you're back. <laughs> um, we, we, we've, we've, we've talked about, uh, uh, you know, how we want to deal with this stuff as a commission. Like, should we, should we answer that question and then, you know, put the question of the awards to that subcommittee or that chair or whatever, and make it their remit to, to answer it. Fine by me. If we can then square <laughs> up that strategic plan and what that is all about. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that makes sense. All right, so we'll table it for now. We'll see what happens. Um, in any case, you know, should we end up doing something? I think December is a horrible time to be doing awards and it should be tied to our June meeting and our week of the arts or day of the arts or whatever we end up doing when we're allowed to do celebrations of that magnitude again. Um, so let's move on on that note to the strategic plan. Karen, have you received any feedback comments from people that um, since the last meeting that you want to share? Um, I have not received any comments or um, suggestions. Uh, I'll share them all. I've had none. So uh, I'm assuming that everyone's had a chance to read it and um, agrees with it. Okay. So who is interested in actually finalizing the strategic plan before the end of, of the year? I am, but I had already done all of the comments and edits and stuff with Karen yeah. at the beginning. Yeah, but at some point we have to actually like sign off on this document and be like, this is it, we're done. Um, we do that now then, if nobody had comments? No, can we not? Well, I would vote. Can I not motion that? I, 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 wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't vote on it without yeah. having everybody read it like in the last 36 hours. Yeah, I would, I would say that we could vote on it next meeting. Okay, yeah. so at the next meeting, we're gonna vote on it. Yeah. So you have, and, and this is kind of a mandate that's coming, but you have two weeks to add any comments that you want because I don't want Karen to be scrambling trying to incorporate comments and suggestions the night before. Um, I want Karen to have a chance to actually have a cohesive, clean document in time for the next meeting in time to give it to you three or four days before the meeting so that you review it and then you can vote on that final draft. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> we'll I leave. actually think there's, there's um, a, a bullet point in there that allows us to address things like the topic that we just talked about, the mm -hmm. um, um, arts awards, you know, talking about uh, being able to address things in the future that are maybe even unseen or known about, you know, in terms of you know, the old hospital property, um, you know, uh, other things. Um, so, I mean, I don't think that um, it should, if, if there is something that isn't happening or you think might be happening, like we were just talking about, I don't think that that would affect just being able to be approved. Correct. And I think at this point, it's just really about that essence of what it is, where we want to focus our energy and what it is that, that we want to accomplish in the next five years from a big picture perspective, not the itemized things. All right. Uh, let's move on to the staff report. So paper pavilions, big updates. Yeah. Uh, let me go back to doing this. Hang on. Uh, let's see. Everybody can see this website, right? Yeah, we're up. So um, just so you all know, uh, in 2018, I got a grant from this organization, which you all should um, get to know, CMAD, they're amazing. Uh, it's the Columbus Museum of Art and Design. It's a small volunteer-led organization based in, in Columbus, Indiana. Uh, and every year they have a grant program where they distribute about $10,000 um, to various projects in Columbus. Um, I'd been toying around with uh, doing something between Columbus and, and Bloomington uh, really since uh, we rebranded Art Road 46 and the Bead, which is our entertainment and arts district. And so uh, they liked the proposed project and um, got, gave me a grant, which then I used to uh, snowball and get the Indian Arts Commission, the National Endowment, Involved, as well as the city of Bloomington and the, the bead. Um, it's a pretty interesting, unique project uh, that, let me go to the artist, um, that kind of celebrates Indiana and Midwest-based artists and kind of pairs them between Columbus and Bloomington and then also the Sycamore Land Trust, which is a really amazing organization that preserves around 10,000 acres 
um, of habitat. And um, so artists have been using both Columbus, Bloomington, and the Sycamore Land Trust as sites of inspiration for new public works. Um, so it's a variety of different artists that are based in Indiana uh, and in the Midwest. So we have uh, Armando and Claire Kruger who are uh, artists based elsewhere. Um, but it's a really interesting model that I think will be able to um, be mimicked and done in other communities in Indiana, which is pretty exciting. Um, we had a partnership originally with an organization in Indianapolis, and it was going to include Indianapolis artists, but that organization ceased operations in the middle of the COVID pandemic. So the project has had its own trials and tribulations and obviously took two years to bring together, um, but it opens on October 1. Really excited about it. Um, there, it will have a virtual opening likely on October 8th. Um, as of now, we are planning an in-person opening on October 1, but it will be, you know, physically distanced and kind of a three people in the music, the gallery at one time uh, with the Columbus Area Arts Council space. Um, and uh, there'll be some programming around that, uh, you know, panels, various things like that. And then we will have another version of the show in Bloomington at some point. The original intent was to have it in December, um, but I'm working on a couple different venues and, and that kind of stuff. So it might change and actually be in the spring of 21. So it just kind of depends. Um, but yeah, that's the, so uh, the website's live. Uh, feel free to dig around um, if you have any questions or thoughts. It's really trying to tie in, um, like I said, this Arts Road 46 project, which is a connection between Bloomington, Nashville, and um, Columbus, the area, like we're the kind of only corridor in the state with the state designated cultural districts. And then we've also tied in other artists that are affiliated with the cultural district program. So Carlson Garcia actually is a collaborative that includes Esteban Garcia, um, who is one of the trades district finalists. And so that's kind of an interesting tie in that he was involved in this project first and then got wind of the trades district proposal and then was able and now is a finalist. So it's kind of trying to build and celebrate Indian artists that are making really good work. Um, the artists are incredible, uh, really excited about, uh, we have some like brand new pieces, uh, well, it's all new work, but um, pretty excited about, you know, like working with Andrea's work, who's at IU, who is also a finalist in the trades district, all that, or that kind of stuff. So any questions, thoughts, concerns? Congratulations. Looks awesome. Also, it's something that uh, I've never thought of and I've tried to do from scratch, just so you all know, is building a website from scratch that's for visually impaired individuals. It's pretty interesting. And I've never, so like we built this website from scratch considering that. It's really, uh, A, everybody should do it. So, you know, there's that. But it's been kind of interesting to think about the back end stuff that like websites just don't consider. Uh, so that's been kind of an interesting conversation. So we're doing that with the show too, with um, you know having enlarged print and those kinds of things to make sure that it's accessible in a variety of different ways, which um, hasn't been considered before. And then we're also publishing a catalog that will be coming. We've hired a graphic designer out of Columbus to do the um, the work for the graphic design work. Sorry, Brian, it's a conflict of interest. Don't, don't worry, no. We, we actually redid our website recently and we tried to do that, but we have over 10,000 articles and 14 years of archives and it was just not possible. Yeah, it's it's really fat. It's like really, really fascinating. Like it, like the new standards around that. And so I don't know if some of you might see like Instagram is trying to catch up with that. So if you see like a description of the caption and. I don't know, it's just a very interesting thing that I never really thought to consider. And it's so much easier to do building from scratch. So sorry for all of you all that are involved in websites, just you gotta start from scratch, unfortunately. It's really, uh, it, it's interesting. It's been an interesting process. Um, we're, yeah, we are like doing our collections online right now and we're doing these new ADA issues. And like, it's super important, but yeah, it's very challenging for I think a lot of us who are 
art historians and not just like descriptive writers, which is actually what is required for a lot of these. Yeah, it's a huge undertaking for anyone, really for anyone. So, yeah. But it's important work to be like, we should have been doing this from the beginning, right? Like, oh, no, exactly. It's sort of like we're at this point where it's like we, we should have been on doing this decades ago and we would be caught up a little bit by now. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll keep you all posted on that kind of stuff. I mean, if there's an opportunity for the commission to be involved, I'm more than happy with a panel. Just let me know. Yeah, more than that, let us know what you need from us if you need us. Will do. Um, space needs assessment is on here. I was hoping that Joanna might join us, but um, she's not. So I'm just going to kind of kick that on to the next meeting potentially and I'll double check with Joanna just to kind of give a report back but please do read that and please um, consider that I mean I know you all just agreed to signing the Waldron letter I think there's some pretty interesting information around uh, kind of space needs obviously it was written pre-COVID so there's some changing uh, around on that Waldron updates I don't have a lot in terms of um, you know uh, it's really kind of we're still in negotiations back and forth doing due diligences um, just so you all know, uh, there's been some buzz around uh, a couple organizations looking into the building. That's totally normal. Uh, it's in a kind of a cardinal stage and a group of uh, theater production groups are kind of um, interested in the building and the future of the building, obviously, because that's cardinal stage is like three quarters of the use of the building. Um, we've also got Mark Levin's class at ASPIA, their, their capstone class, to uh, focus on a feasibility study for the future of the Waldron as well. So they're looking at a couple different models, which would include artist studios, a shop in the basement for the theater companies, and potentially like kind of a co-working space uh, for arts organizations because that came up in the space needs assessment. So having, and it's not like, no offense to Sam, the mill folks, it's not like a entrepreneur co-working space, but more of shared resources, boardroom, fax, copier, printer, those kinds of things for arts organizations specifically. There's a couple of interesting models in Oklahoma City, actually, of a kind of a shared nonprofit office space. Um, so we're, I'm having them look into that and uh, we're moving forward. Thank you all for those who attended the city council meeting for the budgets. We're not in the clear yet. Um, it goes on the final vote in October and that will help determine kind of some of the timing of the Waldron frankly, and when the transfer of the building will happen, knowing that we have funding set aside for the future of that. Uh, we also, um, the city has made a request, the mayor has made a request to increase local income tax. I'm sure you all um, are aware of that. Uh, it goes to city council tonight at 730 for the introduction of the resolution, and then it's back on the agenda for the 16th of September. Um, there is money allotted for arts support uh, specifically uh, spelled out for the Buskirk Chumley, uh, Ivy Tech Waldron, and then uh, an expansion of the arts grants. And that would start in 2022 and be continued as long as we have the increase in local income tax. The recommendation is around 300,000. Uh, so just so you all know, and if you feel comfortable and want to speak, feel free or reach out to your elected officials, that would be great, but obviously no pressure. It's a slightly you know, controversial, uh, raising taxes is always controversial. Uh, so there's that, and I think that's it for staff updates at the moment. So any other kind of questions? And that also, I just like ramrodded about lit. So if you have any questions about that, that was I'm happy to answer. That's a, a, a moving target. It was proposed in January of this year, pre-COVID, to address climate change. It's still addressing climate change, but now it's had an expanded kind of scope towards uh, racial justice work in the in our community as well as climate justice and economic justice in terms of um, being responsive to COVID and its impacts on COVID in our community. All right, any questions for Sean? All right. Well, from me, you don't have much, just your homework, the strategic plan, um, and those who will be reviewing uh, grants, just you know, familiarize yourselves with the questions in be alert with your email. Make sure that you're getting any messages from Sean. If you have any questions, let him know. Um, if for whatever reason you end up having a conflict, your schedule gets crazy, anything like that, let us know and we'll 
have somebody else do it, that's no problem. But hopefully that will not be the case. Um, I don't think we have any members of the public at this point. Ellen finally joined us. I want to put her on the spot. Ellen. All right. Turn on, turn on your camera. Say hey to everyone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Love to be put on the spot like this. Everyone, this is Helen. She's an amazing second year MPA MAA student with Tyler. We're going to get so much done having Helen and Tyler as the dynamic duo in, in the ESD department. And so Helen will be involved in a variety of different projects that obviously you all are involved in too. And so I just wanted to make sure that everybody got um, introduced to Helen. So perfect. Helen. BAC, wow. BAC, Helen. Welcome <laughs> to the pack. Thank you. All right, commissioner announcements. Yeah, I have one. In two and a half weeks, Midway Music Festival starts and Summit. Midway Music Festival and Summit. We have a summit this year as well. Uh, it's a week long of a bunch of events and stuff. It's all virtual. Um, and we have some really amazing artists. Sudan Archives is headlining. Uh, Jag Jaguars, OK Kaya is performing. Uh, Kadri Benet, Madison McFerrin, really great people. Um, and then we have a lot of industry professionals that are calling in as well to discuss topics like um, artist and label management, uh, audio engineering, um, effective a &R, things like that, uh, in photography and video. And um, we have people from labels all over. So it's not just a bunch of secretly staff. We've got people coming calling in from um, lab labels that we distribute for, um, as well as uh, a few other areas like Women's Audio Mission, um, a few studios, one in Louisville, a studio that's in LA, a recording studio, and um, also one of the VPs at Warner Music um, will be calling in. So that's going to be exciting. Um, but yeah, it's single tickets are $3. You really can't beat it if you want to just go to one show. It's only three bucks um, or you can get a pass and go to all of them. Um, but yeah, and I hope to see people like more people and commissioners there. So consider getting a ticket. Anybody else? The Eskenazi Museum of Art is reopened. It is there Thursday to Sunday. The hours vary. It tends to be from 11 to 5 or 11 to 7. I can't remember um, because just COVID things. But if you ever want to come in and hang out, let me know. I, I love going into the galleries and like hanging with people and talking with them. And I can do that any day of the week. So um, please go to the Eskenazi Museum, but also please hit me up for just like a private tour because uh, I did one today. And we had a fire drill. It was ridiculous, but it was so much fun. Yeah, we had our annual fire drill while I was like zooming 80 like freshman art history 101 students. It was a lot of fun. Anyway, so anytime you want to come to the museum, write me an email. It it makes my day a better day. So please do that. Elliot, is it is it by appointment only? I, I I'm confused about certain things on campus and because yeah, of no, public that's, like that's a great question. So the museum is so the museum is open every day of the week, but mostly at just the atrium and the Grubhub Cafe, which is what we're doing now. Um, but the galleries are open Thursday through Sunday, so Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The hours are usually 11 through 5. I think on Saturday, it's 11 through 7. I'm going to guess this is on your website. Yeah, okay. hopefully. <laughs> I don't, you know, it's, yeah. All to say, though, I'm there all the time or home all the time. And um, uh, I had a really good time, like, doing a walkthrough today with some IU undergrads. Um, so if you ever want to go through the museum, feel free to come through the public hours. If you ever want to just look at the museum, I can take you through any time. You can look at anything you want. Let me know. Tuesday, Monday, it doesn't matter to me. It's nice to actually go into the museum and like chat with people about stuff. So, uh, you know, do my 
do me well, just like make me happy, come anytime, you're very welcome. There's also public hours. All right, I'll take you up on that at some point. Please do. I, I, I really I don't need e learning, so. Elliot is locked in a museum, so everybody go see Elliot. That's very clear. <laughs> Please do it, because I, you know, I like talking to people, not as much the art. The art's fine. I I know the art, yeah. Well, and another IU connection, too, uh, if you all haven't, uh, it's by appointment only. The Grunwald has an amazing show that Betsy Sturette curated called State of Nature. It's all about Indiana. Absolutely amazing. It's a partnership with the Indiana State Museum and various artists. Definitely check out the show. It's incredible. Uh, I have just a quick one. Um, I used to plug Collide, which was our event at the mill. And then we did Zoom meetings. And anyway, we're going to try a new thing this month. It's just like a YouTube video. Basically, I get my own YouTube show. Uh, and I'm going to edit it. And it's a comedy show. Yeah, it's going to be very sporadic <laughs> and, and lo-fi. Lo um, anyway, the exciting part is that we're interviewing um, John Armstrong from the Bloomington Arts and Film Theater, Bloomington Academy of Film and Theater, um, that I got to interview with Bryony um, when we were for something a while ago. So uh, that connection came through and, has, and is cool, and I'm excited to, to tour with him. So uh, the thing is, you can now just watch the YouTube video whenever you want. It'll be, I'm shooting for 10 minutes, uh, and please like watch it and share it because um, I get a raise if I get a hundred views. Just kidding about that part, but um, we're sh we're shooting for a hundred views in a day, which like I don't know if that's reasonable, but we're just trying to put out good content that people want to see and highlight people doing good things in the in the community. Can you send us a link? Yes, I'll I'll send a I'll spam you all with a link. I probably yeah probably just, like, thing. push push play and then open another window if you want, but yeah. Can we expect a lot of jokes? Yeah. I need humor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Well, it seems that we can adjourn this meeting at 622, a whole eight minutes ahead of schedule. Thank you, everybody. I hope you have a good night and uh, a good week ahead. See ya. Thanks, everyone. Good seeing you all.